the idea with this talk is to give you a couple of interesting tools. One of them is going to allow you to completely piss off your Scrum Master so they leave you alone. And another tool is going to let you spend about 10 minutes more per user story and make it 10,000 times more effective. So that's kind of my promise for, for today. And um, in order to kind of figure out who we have in the room so I can adjust the talk a bit, uh, how many of you use Twitter every day? Okay, there's a few. How many of you use Twitter every week or something like that? Most of you, okay. So you guys, kind of at the end of this, if you think the presentation shit, just tweet Goiko's presentation was complete shit. But if you think it was good, then kind of tweet something nice. So how many of you use Facebook occasionally? Okay, most of the people in the room. So kind of the same thing. How many of you use MySpace? Okay, we have a problem with this now a bit. So there's no MySpace users here. Um, do we have anybody who has a PhD in mathematics? One person, okay. Then you replace the MySpace users. And because we have a person who has a PhD in mathematics, if you can kind of just come to the first row later, I'll need you to help me with something so they don't know I'm cheating, so they know that I'm not cheating. You will be there to make sure as, you know, somebody who does maths really good that I'm not talking bullshit, yeah? Good. And you will get paid by a deck of cards for that. So, um, kind of, uh, there's been a lot of talk um, today about what companies do that's insane and what companies do that is a bit more sane and things like that. And I want to talk about something that I think is more psychological, that has a huge impact on how we deliver stuff and, and what we do. And a lot of the stuff that people in the software industry tend to kind of rediscover and rediscover and rediscover and that you hear at conferences as brilliant ideas that somebody just invented last year have actually been around for hundreds of years. For example, I found a book where Lean Startup was more or less described that was written about 100 years ago. And I'll kind of give you a reference for that later. And kind of some of this stuff that we talk about now, in particular about scaling projects, there's kind of this whole buzz about scaling agile and things like that. Those problems were solved a long time ago. And the stuff we can learn from kind of history and other industries and things like that, that we seem to be reinventing all the time. So one of the really interesting things when we talk about kind of scaling and, and large scale projects uh, under time pressure and kind of dangerous kind of deadlines that need to be hit um, is kind of, th there's one of my favorite projects like that was done by about 600 people um, relatively close to here. Uh, in 1944, kind of, and this was kind of, these guys were in a prison camp and they were going to figure out how to escape. Uh, and there was about 600 of them that wanted to kind of get involved in this activity. So they decided that they're going to kind of finally run away from this camp. And unfortunately, the camp was built to prevent escaping, of course. So kind of the barracks were built in the middle of the camp so people can't just sneak away. They were built on sandy ground. So if people try to dig the kind of the, the tunnels would cave in and the Germans, you know, you have to love them. They even put seismometers in the ground so they could pre kind of hear anybody trying to escape and measure stuff and things like that. And these guys kind of organized without any kind of uh, external help to dig not one but three tunnels through sandy ground about 100 meters long each. And what they had to do in order to prevent the Germans from hearing them with seismometers was to actually dig holes that were nine meters deep in the ground and then dig a hundred meters. So they had no equipment. And one of the things they had to do is kind of scavenge equipment from the prison camp, which, you know, when we talk about dangerous projects, kind of that beats any software project I was involved in. And kind of because none of them had the lung capacity of um, Tim Robbins from Shawshank Redemption, they actually had to build a whole pumping system to pump fresh air into these tunnels. So a guy called Bob Nelson deserved a place in engineering history for inventing a pumping system 
from the stuff they could basically scavenge in the camp and being able to supply air through those tunnels. And this was kind of such a massive effort on such a scale and done with such kind of opposing odds that, of course, it was immortalized by Hollywood as kind of the great escape, Steve, starring Steve McQueen and everything, you know, there was amazing. And kind of at the end, 76 people kind of ran through these tunnels and escaped. And this is still one of the most kind of memorable stories of World War II. Kind of people get inspiration in, in this. And, you know, um, even kind of cartoons get done, like Chicken Run was inspired by this. So there's, there's an immense cultural influence of this on modern people. And I think that's part of the problem. And part of the problem was that kind of although 76 people ran through the tunnels, uh, most of them were caught the next day. With so many variables in play, something had to go wrong. And kind of what went wrong is the tunnels were too short, so they were too close to the fence, and as people started running out, the guards spotted them. So kind of they picked up almost everybody. Only three people reached safety. Most of them were picked up, returned to the camp. About 50 of them were executed the next day. So at the same time, in the same camp, Another group of people, much, much smaller, only three of them, didn't really have 600 people to dig. So they decided not to try something that big, but decided to kind of try and solve the problem differently. Instead of digging 100 meters through the sand from the barracks, what they decided to do is they decided to build a kind of wooden exercise horse and then kind of pretend to be exercising and put that very close to the fence. And then one person who was in the exercise horse would kind of basically open a shaft, start digging during the day, and other people would jump around the horse to trick the seismometers. And these guys dug a tunnel that was about 20 meters long, and they were digging it very close to the surface because they could trick the seismometers, which meant they didn't have to invent another pumping system, they didn't have to kind of risk lots of other things, and at the end of the day, all these three people escaped and reached safety. So if you compare those two projects, kind of same constraints, same camp, everything the same, this thing involved 600 people, only three people reached safety and 50 people died. The other thing involved three people, everybody escaped, nobody died. So kind of looking at the effort spent, this one is, is amazing. It's kind of, you know, it's what people tell stories about. Nobody even knows about the other thing. You have to kind of Google very, very deep to discover it. And kind of in terms of what we celebrate, we celebrate this one as the great escape. And the other one is, ah, oh, kind of three people escaped, who cares? But if you look at the result, the result is kind of pretty much absolutely the same in the positive sense, a negative one. Kind of this thing spent a lot more money, killed a lot more people. So I'd kind of say that the other thing was great and this one was a bit rubbish, but, you know, then I'll start offending war heroes. So kind of the big problem with this is as, as kind of um, w psychologically, there's something wrong with, with the general population. We tend to assign greatness to effort. And you only need to look at LinkedIn to figure that out. Kind of on LinkedIn, most people advertise, oh, you know, I've managed this 3 million to 5 million project and it involved 500 people and it was brilliant. Nobody talks about what the client actually got for that kind of money. It's great because, you know, we, we spent $5 million on it. So kind of the next time you have a project manager come to you with something like this, there's a very, very important measurement you can do to basically show them how that is not exactly the most relevant thing. So at this point, I will need my mathematician friend to come down. Okay, that's a bit of a bummer. So would anybody else like to volunteer to help me? You don't have to be kind of a PhD in mathematics. You just have to know to count, really. Okay, bring your phone. Do you have a, do you have a mobile phone with a... We need... We, thank you very much. We need a mobile phone with a, with a kind of a timer on it. That, that's okay, that's okay. So we have, we have a volunteer here who will literally lis risk life and limb here to show you this. Hi, Hi. I'm Goiko. I'm Mirek. I'm Mirek, nice to meet you. I'm Mirek. Yes. Great. An applause for Mirek, please. So, Mirek, you, you will need to time something. So all you need to do when you have a project manager that comes to you with kind of, oh, you know, I've done 5 million projects and it's all been great and things like that is do this kind of a metric. And for that, you need a volunteer 
and you need a mobile phone that can measure time. Hopefully all mobile phones can do that. Nobody's using Nokia anymore. So um, in order to, I'll, I'll tell you when to start measuring. So in order to kind of illustrate this, we'll use a very particular project that I love kind of using as a use case. And this was the NHS IT project in, in Great Britain. NHS IT is famous for running seven billion pounds over budget before somebody noticed that something is wrong. So, so we have kind of, you know, at, at some point in uh, a couple of years ago, they canceled this. And by that point, it was 11 billion pounds spent. And it was one of these great projects. So at this point, kind of what you can do is you can start comparing a project like this with the optimum continuous delivery pipeline. Everybody wants to do continuous delivery these days and kind of continuous delivery can go fast and fast and fast, but it's kind of a limit to that, how fast you can do and make things good. So there's a, there's a very interesting measurement for a continuous delivery pipeline performance that you can do. So here's what we'll measure now. And when I tell you to start measuring, can we have the sound up? Is that the sound up? Okay. So you will start measuring the optimum continuous delivery pipeline cycle. Yeah? Three, four, start. Okay, how long? 29 seconds. Thank you very much. An applause. So, we have an optimum continuous delivery pipeline of 29 seconds, which means that if somebody's working really, really hard, they can probably do this two times a minute, which means that if we kind of scale it to an hour, that's about 120 deliveries per hour, which means that if somebody's working eight hours a day, it's coming close to about 960 per day. Let's not do overtime. So, Kind of with this, you know, if you take away a couple of days for holidays and, you know, industrial strikes and things like that, we get about 200,034 per year. So I, my, my company is kind of British and I'll, I'll do this in British pounds, but you can do it in Zloty as well. So if you take, say, 50 pound notes, that's kind of the biggest thing you can put in. I assume it's relatively safe to put about 20 in and then flush. Otherwise, you get an overflow, things get stuck, and then you have to kind of fix things to interrupt the pipeline. So kind of a safe pipeline can do about 20 of these notes. That's a thousand quid. So what we get is there about 234 million flush down the toilet per year. That's kind of the optimum thing we can do. Now, if you look at kind of that and we look at the stuff that the NHS IT is doing, so you can compare your project to this, they had about 11 billion pounds, which means that it's going to take them 47 years to flush this down the toilet. And they were able to do it in only nine, which means they have a flush factor of 522. So You can calculate the flash factor like this very easily for your project and they'll tell the project manager who came and said, you know, this was a five million project, basically, fuck off. So, kind of, and, and you know, th this is, we, we, we know about this problem, we've kind of solved this problem and, and things like that, but this is one of those kind of let's do things at scale things. And when people talk about scaled agile these days, that's what I'm really afraid of because everybody's talking about scaled as more people, more locations, more time, bigger stuff. And we end up kind of with stuff that has a very, very high flush factor. So kind of, and, and most people say, oh, you know, it's a government project. You'll never be able to run government projects any differently. This is something kind of at that scale, but that's wrong. Government projects have been run differently for hundreds of years. For example, I found a very, very large scale, very risky, very, very agile project that was run by a government about 400 years ago. That's kind of the earliest I found. I've done a lot of research. This is the earliest Agile project I've ever found. And it's an Agile project in the true sense where the product owner was involved and the product owner was changing requirements all the time. There was a huge amount of risk, a huge amount of budget, and people that were implementing this project were kind of adjusting to changing requirements all the time and they shipped at the end. This was 
a fantastic warship production project in 1628 if you wanted to kind of show that you are an important country what you basically did is you built a warship and that put you on the map everybody would be scared of you so the king of sweden decided to build the biggest the baddest warship in europe and he was going to build something that was going to scare everybody else away so at this point there was a slight problem the problem was that there was a shift in technology very similar to how today we have kind of cloud coming and people don't really know if they want an on-premise solution or a cloud solution he did not know what to bet on in 1628 cannons just became small enough to be able to put on a ship before 1628 kind of what people did when they built warships is they built it basically for marines you would put lots of people on a warship you drum it into another ship jump kill everybody on-premise deployment kind of 1620s cloud deployment started becoming possible you just put cannons on a ship you come close to the other ship they're trying to kind of ram into you shoot them and you sink them and that was brilliant but that was unconfirmed technology so the king couldn't really decide whether he wanted a cloud deployment or an on-premise deployment so one day he'd want a very kind of broad ship for lots of cannons the other day he'd come and say no no i kind of changed my mind what we want is a very kind of narrow fast ship that's going to kind of you know leave a small footprint so we can hit other ships and then he even one day came and said no no uh, look this material that we have can we actually make two ships and they started dismantling this big ship making two ships out of it then a month later he came and said i changed my mind one ship big one and despite of all this people who were building a ship then delivered this amazing stuff amazing stuff you can still go to stockholm today and see it in a museum it's called vasa and it's amazing because it was shipped on time on budget and it was shipped in a very very particular way kind of the day before it was supposed to ship the king changed his mind again and he said i want more cannons on the ship and then when it shipped it started going and it shipped for about a kilometer and a half and then toppled over and sank in the cold seas of sweden and kind of this is what really bugs me about kind of software again where if we talk about iterative delivery if you talk about shipping most people are proud oh you know we've shipped it and nobody's thinking about whether we have shipped it like this and it just kind of turns over immediately and we need to start kind of solving these two problems kind of business people are really scared of iterative delivery because this can happen at the same time kind of running stuff in big 11 year 11 billion project doesn't make sense anymore at all so we need to kind of resolve these two forces and kind of the big problem with that is that at the moment in the agile community we have something that's pretty much preventing us from doing that effectively and we have stuff that looks like this this is how most people kind of manage their requirements this is how most people approach customer needs and this kind of user story template seems to be by far kind of the most popular one out there and what i'm going to do today is i'm going to show you how to spend 10 more minutes on this thing to make it really effective so we we can avoid the whole kind of ship sinking problem and kind of the big problem with this is people kind of approach these things as requirements but they need to be small they need to be valuable they need to be deliverable within a sprint they need to be lots of things and then we end up with a ton of them and we put them in kind of a jira thing or something like that and i love kind of the fact that jira is an issue tracker because at the point when you have a hundred items in jira you actually do have an issue with the project so lots of people think you know these are our requirements and all we need to do is implement this but those are not requirements requirements are never ever ever in jira all the projects i've ever been involved in requirements were always in one single tool powerpoint kind of the most important thing to find on a project is find a person who has this powerpoint somewhere on his laptop and that's kind of the, the roadmap and this is an example of a adobe cold fusion roadmap um because this is being filmed i feel obliged to say that you know i don't have the copyright right to use this but i will kind of mock this later so copyright rules allow me to make fun of this and the big problem with these two things is they're completely disconnected the whole jira blah 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 as i blah 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 in order to blah 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 i want is completely disconnected from this there's no connection to something like this and then this can be full of incredible buzzwords like cloud mobile enterprise uh 
professional and and things like that and this does not really provide a good context for us to deliver stuff um there was the, the, the big problem with all of these things is they're linear this thing is linear it's kind of things that happen in sequence this thing is kind of almost linear things get reordered but at the end of the day all of them get done now there was a Russian engineer who lived in Imperial Russia and kind of later under the Soviets who kind of invented lean startup about 100 years ago and he was dealing with the same problem in civil engineering he said that basically linear plans almost never work because not because people who make those plans are stupid but because things happen beyond our control the kind of linear plans linear backlogs linear lists of things kind of become invalidated very quickly because of three things that we cannot control and he said basically there's a time-based dimension that we can't control as soon as we start delivering stuff somebody else somewhere else starts doing stuff for example i'm working on a collaboration tool at the moment and as we were building the stuff that we were supposed to sell we were supposed to sell multi-user single user was free google published their real-time api for free that pretty much allowed anybody in the world to make real-time collaboration products on much better infrastructure than we can offer and offer it for free. I can't control that. I don't even know that's happening, but that completely invalidated our business model. Now, we can continue delivering and fail, or we can kind of spot that and figure out what to do about that. And kind of the other dimension that he's talking is a kind of local dimension uh, where things might work well in one locality, they don't work well in another, or kind of things open up that we don't really know about. For example, with this collaboration tool, all of a sudden, we started getting a ton of JavaScript errors with the new release. And when we looked at the Google Analytics, most of those errors were coming from Spain, which made no sense at all because our software is not internationalized at all. It's kind of only English. And we started digging into this, and then we figured that kind of most people in Spain were probably using Google Translate for this. And we were using a button label as a variable name. And it had one of those kind of weird Spanish characters in when it gets translated to Spanish and it broke a JavaScript. Kind of, you know, I didn't know that. Kind of now I know it, but at the time that was a completely uncontrollable dimension for me. And kind of the third thing he talks about is kind of humans are essentially unpredictable. Where you might think they're going to do something, but they do something completely different. And one of the best case studies for this is the IBM PC Junior. Um, Anton Ulwick, who led the IBM PC Junior program was kind of so inspired by what he's done to write a book called What Customers Want. And Anthony is kind of in charge of what some regard as the second worst lo product launch ever because he lost about half a billion dollars on it. And it was done absolutely according to customer specifications. They spent a lot of time and money interviewing customers what they want and things like that. And then they built a machine, but it turns out nobody wanted to buy it. Humans are unpredictable. And then Anthony wrote a book about how customers don't know what they want. Even if they know what they want, they can't express it. And what they want now might not be what they want in the future. And how it's stupid to build stuff that people tell you they want. So kind of these three dimensions are not just stuff that kind of kills projects. They also open up really incredible business opportunities. And that's what kind of Peter Palczynski was writing about. He said that basically, if we can spot these things, we can react to them earlier. And his work was kind of enhanced by a British economist called Tim Hartford, who, who wrote a fantastic book called Adapt. And in Adapt, he writes about how if we can be faster spotting these things, we can't predict them, we cannot control them, but if we can be the fastest to spot these things, because they happen to us at the same time when they happen to the competition, we can turn this thing into a massive advantage. Opportunities open up. For example, if we look at the time-based dimension, there was a fantastic opportunity on eBay a couple of months ago. There was a Tupolev strategic bomber on offer, only for a week. And the price was, you know, only $3 million. And payment was cash in person. Amazing stuff. <laughs> so, you know, if you are looking to buy a strategic bomber, this is a brilliant opportunity that kind of opens up and closes very quickly when the eBay people shut it down. 
So the other thing that's kind of a local dimension is also something that opens up really interesting business opportunities that most people kind of, you know, ignore. For example, I travel a lot for conferences and I was in Israel a couple of years ago and I always wanted to see Krak de Chevalier. That's kind of one of the biggest fortresses of the medieval times. And this was my chance to go and see that. It was very close and it's in Syria. So kind of pretty much I'm not going to get the chance to see that ever again. And I was stupid. I didn't go and see that and kind of... Stuff, for example, you know, close to Warsaw, there's lots of history. There's a famous fortress very close to here where the Polish army fought the Germans at the start of the World War, then Second World War, then the Russians fought the Germans, then everybody else fought the Germans, then kind of there's lots of stuff and it's been damaged badly, but it's, it's a massive piece of history. And, you know, I like to see fortresses. This was my opportunity to go and see that. And it's only kind of something like... 200 kilometers away or something like that. So, you know, this is a brilliant opportunity. I'll fly out tonight. I'll probably not come to Warsaw for another couple of years. I've missed this opportunity. And things like this open up in software all the time. And they close. And if we can be the first to spot this, we can take, you know, run circles around the competition. So this is what kind of Palczynski wrote about. And he formulated three principles for plans to actually use this stuff. And he formulated these principles as kind of variation in terms of because we don't really know what's going to work, what's not going to work, local, human, time-based dimensions, just try out lots of new things. And as we try these things, then the second principle comes in that survivability. We should try these things on a scale that doesn't kill the company. We shouldn't spend 11 billion until we figure out that something's going wrong. And the third principle that Palczynski formulated is something how we can design our plans is selection. Basically, out of the stuff that we tried out, seek out feedback and figure out what worked, what didn't work, do the stuff that worked more. And kind of, this is lean startup. This is build, measure, learn. And this was invented 100 years ago. And if we really dig deep into kind of the purpose of this, what he's talking about is try out things, get feedback. And he's saying that kind of these things are really bad roadmaps. We can call these things roadmaps, but they're really, really bad because there's no success criteria here apart from, oh, we spent nine months. There's no victory condition here. There's no way to select stuff that succeeded and failed. Ronnie Kohavi from Microsoft wrote a brilliant paper in 2009 called Online Experimentation at Microsoft, where he talks about how, based on the data they pulled out, only about one-third of the initiatives they've done a couple of years prior to that research only one third of the initiatives improved the metrics they were supposed to improve. About one third of the metrics didn't do anything positive and about one third of the metrics, one third of initiatives actually damaged the stuff they were supposed to improve. Now, Microsoft is a smart company. They can invest a lot of money in their stuff and if they get it right only one third of the time, then kind of probably two thirds of the stuff on this thing is rubbish. And we don't know which two thirds. What Palczynski is writing about is these things are not roadmaps. These things are roadmaps. The trick is in the name. It's a map of roads. We have lots of options. We have an option of doing this. We have an option of doing that. For example, Piotr told us yesterday, don't even try to take a taxi in Warsaw at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's going to be very congested. It's going to take you an hour and a half to get here from the hotel. Most people kind of walked to the station and then got on the metro and things like that. I looked at this this morning and it's dope. Kind of 24 minutes with the current traffic. Yeah jumped into a cab and I was here first. So if we can have kind of a dynamic roadmap like this, if we can have good feedback, if we have multiple options where if one road is stuck, we just go to the other. If we can have operational awareness, we can benefit from things like this. We can exploit opportunities that open up at that particular moment. I'm pretty sure that Piotr wasn't kind of evil to us and that most of the days, nine o'clock in the morning is really bad time to kind of take a taxi in central Warsaw. But hey, time-based dimension opened up for me. So what, what, what we can do with this stuff is kind of we can start approaching our plans slightly differently. And the big problem with this is the way we use maps like this changed quite significantly over the last 10 or 15 years. They became a lot more useful. What we used to do, at least what I used to do, because I never learned how to drive. I was always kind of on the next seat to the driver and my wife would typically drive. And what we do is we'd plan a journey through a map 
especially if you're working, if you're driving in a unknown country, we'd kind of plan the whole thing, and then she'd start driving, and I'd start flipping the book, kind of, to find the right page, and then she'd start calling me a moron because I missed the page, and I would call her a moron because she missed a turn, and then we'd keep calling, you know, other, each other idiots, and then at some point we realized we're completely lost, and then we have to stop, we have to get a coffee, chill out, and then ask, you know, somebody in the coffee shop where we actually are on the map, and then we do the same thing again, replan and get lost half an hour later and kind of end up in another coffee shop. Now, about 10 years ago, we bought a marriage saving device. We no longer have to call each other idiots. And if you're having a problem with your wife or your husband, I strongly suggest buying this stuff. It's amazing. Because you no longer have to kind of flip through book pages. You no longer have to kind of complain. You no longer, anybody has to be an idiot. If she misses a turn, not a problem at all. Tom Tom is going to find an alternative route. And kind of things like this made maps incredibly more useful. Now, the big problem is our software projects, our software plans are still at this kind of evolutionary stage where we only have a map. We, anybody can come up with options. That's not a problem at all. The problem that we have is we lack an easy way to replan, and we lack operational awareness. What GPS brought to the scene, unlike a kind of map in a book, is this stuff here, turn-by-turn -turn navigation. And it brought this stuff here, where kind of it can tell me that, hey, based on your current location, doesn't matter kind of which road you take, but you're about half an hour away. So you can kind of plan for stuff that needs to happen. If you're very late, you can call. You know, you're not going to be there in time. But if you still have 45 minutes to get there, pretty much that's okay. You don't have to warn anybody. So these two things are missing from our software projects. And if we were able to come up with turn-by-turn -turn navigation and operational awareness like this, we would be able to create a GPS for our software, which means that if something unexpected happens, we just replan very quickly. TomTom -tom does it for us. So my challenge for you today is when you go away from this, think about how you're going to create a GPS navigator for your software plans. I have one idea that kind of worked for me. I'm not saying I solved the problem universally. I'll tell you that idea later. But kind of even if you don't use that, find some other way of making replanning ridiculously cheap. What TomTom -Tom did for us while driving is it made replanning ridiculously cheap. So we don't have to plan big, we don't have to think big, we can have operational awareness and, hey, if something unexpected happens, like this morning, the road through Warsaw is clear, vroom. if it's blocked, it's okay, we'll find another way and things like that. So kind of that's the thing I'm, I'm, I want you to think about. Now, kind of when we go back to the stuff we have and kind of use stories like this, the big problem with this is there is nothing that can help us have operational awareness absolutely nothing here and if you look at kind of the Palchinsky principles when we talk about variation survivability and selection variation is easy people can get drunk there's some good vodka here you can come up with five million user stories that's no problem at all survivability we've learned how to split user stories to be small so they're kind of survivable now the big problem we have is with principle number three selection how do we seek out feedback from these user stories? How do we know if a user story was a good idea or not? Not whether it was implemented okay. That's easy. Was it a good idea? Was it a good idea at the time because of a time-based dimension, a local dimension, a human dimension that might be outside of our control? And is it one of those two-thirds of kind of initiatives at Microsoft that just did not improve anything? Or is it something that opens up and we should really exploit that part because it was unexpectedly good? And there's nothing on a user story to tell us that. The way most people seek selection from the user stories is like this. So, you know, somebody does a bit of tests, then logs a critical bug. It's critical for four weeks and five days. That's a completely new definition of critical for me. Kind of the other stuff we do is, you know, we, we, we run a bunch of code coverage and then we show this to somebody and say, oh, you know, why does this have 28.57? Improve that. And this is all incredibly precise. It's incredibly precise. But it doesn't say anything about how important anything is. or It doesn't say anything about whether this was a good idea or not. So it's not enough. 
And because this is not enough, then people add up more stuff and create dashboards like this. And we have brilliant analytics like, oh, there's 10,078 violations in this, out of which 8,000 are major. And they've been there for six months, and it's brilliant. And this is kind of all, it's useful stuff for development purposes, but it's not that good to tell us whether this was a good idea or not and whether we actually succeeded or not. So the way people measure success today is completely broken. Most kind of, especially teams that start doing Scrum, they start looking at kind of success as velocity and things like that. And kind of we start measuring it with this stuff. This graph I stole from rapidscrum.com and it's talking, you can find it to this URL. It's talking about the Scrum shock therapy adoption where it's one of my favorite graphs. I take it with me every time I do a kind of a new client engagement and I show it to the managers of kind of my client. And we go through this story because kind of, this is a story how a team was made to be 400% hyper productive in eight months. And then I asked the managers, would you like to get your teams 400% hyper productive? And I've never had anybody saying no. So, Kind of the big problem with this is kind of it's treating improvements in velocity as productivity. And kind of here's where this is getting slightly wrong. So kind of if you look at just velocity, say I did want to go and visit the kind of Brest Fortress and this fortress, Google tells us it's three hours, five minutes. We have multiple options to go there. And all of those kind of involve going through the Belarus border which means that, you know, we might be facing some delays at the border. Nobody really knows what's happening there. And the guy with the mustache might decide not to let us in or something like that. So kind of, you know, one estimate of this, and let's say team number one kind of decides to drive here and by driving for two hours and kind of crossing 20, 200 kilometers, they end up with a velocity of 70 kilometers per hour. That's one option. Now, kind of, that's not particularly good. That's a bit slow. I don't have a lot of time. I'm here only for one day. I don't want to lose this much time and things that. And now we can look at, you know, do we have any other options with velocity? And team number two says, oh, we've looked at this a bit. Why, you know, why are we driving? Let's use a plane. Plane is much faster. We can use a plane. We can't land in Brest, but, you know, there's an airport very close by. So we can go to the other airport and just drive for a very short period of time. That gives us the average velocity of 380 kilometers per hour. Now, is this good or bad? Who thinks this is good? There's three or four people in the room that think this is good. Okay. So if we kind of, why do people who think this is bad think this is bad? So, okay, we have a check-in, we have to get to Brest from the airport. It's not kind of velocity, is not the only thing. Somebody else said you have to wait at the airport. Yeah? So, kind of the total time might actually be longer. Now, let's say that the team number two found a way to total time is 2 hours 30. With the check-in and driving and everything. Does this improve the situation? Who thinks this is good now? Okay, more people. Who thinks this is really bad? Why? Hmm? Well, cost, kind of, let's say it's, it's a cheap airline, it's almost the same, and we actually did it. So cost and risk are the same. And actually, let's say that the thing is less risky. So has that convinced you this is better now? Aha, we have somebody who does mathematics, so distance. If you take this velocity at this, speed, at this time, you cross 927 kilometers. So, why should you care about that, okay? So do you think this is kind of who, who I, I have a deck of cards here for somebody who can tell me what went wrong. No, no, no. The plane arrived. This is done. We both teams are in Brest. Hmm? No, no, this is whole time. This is whole time. No, 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 this is, this is the entire time. From door to door, this is the entire time. This is a different city. It's a breast somewhere completely different. So, so, 
We had an agile team and the agile team said, look, you know, the guy, the mustache at the border, that's a big risk. Let's not cross the border. You know, we'll just find a different breast for you and that's all fine. You know, it's, we're going to do a product demo at the end of the iteration. We know it's not going to be right. It's agile. Hey, you know, we replan. And at this point, you know, the product owner is just lucky we're not in breast in France. That's all the way up there. <laughs> so the big problem with just looking at velocity is we have no clue where we are. We absolutely have no clue where we are. And deciding that better velocity is good is dangerous. It's kind of velocity is, a, is an operational metric that's telling us whether the engine is working okay or not. It's not telling us whether we're driving in a completely wrong direction, whether we're in the wrong lane on the motorway, whether we're heading at the completely wrong thing. And just by having that, kind of agile teams end up doing this all the time. So we need to fix this. We, we need to create something that gives us operational awareness around this stuff. And if you look back at kind of this, this is a story about MySpace from 2009. That's so brilliant about it. This is kind of where they made the team 400% hyper-productive and MySpace in 2000 was the number one product. Facebook was still emerging. And good for them, yeah, they're, they're fantastically successful. So whenever kind of you have a Scrum Master that's talking about improving velocity and things like that, just kind of show them this. And they're going to be so pissed off they'll let you do your own work and move on with the stuff. So kind of going back to kind of this, we need to start creating turn-by-turn -turn navigation. We need to start creating something that gives us a better way of navigating through this landscape. And kind of, if you look at the user story like this, the problem with this stuff is there's no victory condition there. There's nothing to tell us whether we have succeeded or failed, whether the story was a good idea. We can only measure whether we've done what we agreed to do. And Anthony Ulrich's big idea from what customers want is that plans based on the behavior of what people want to do are destined for failure. If we talk about the type of work people do and then analyze stuff based on that, that's failure. If we talk about what they tell us they want as kind of a type of work, a behavior, that's going to fail. This middle part cannot stay like this. Because if we talk about in order to monitor inventory, this person was probably able to monitor the inventory before the story was even thought of. There's a legacy system. He can go to the warehouse and count the boxes. There's lots of ways of monitoring the inventory. What Anthony Ulrich talks about is instead of talking about the type of work people do, figure out what is the change in that behavior. Because a change gives you turn-by-turn -turn navigation. A change gives you a victory condition. A change gives you something you can talk about whether you've achieved it or not. And whenever you get something like this, you can say, well, how differently? So if you remember one thing from this talk, remember that every time you get a user story that's talking about the behavior, push back and say, how differently? How differently from what they do th at this moment? Because a change in somebody's behavior should be observable. We should be able to see it. We should be able to measure it. We should be able to prove whether this actually achieved what it was supposed to achieve or not. So what's going to happen when you start asking for the change in a behavior? You'll hear lots of stupid excuses. Somebody's going to say, oh, it's going to be cheaper. And then you're going to say, OK, how much cheaper and in what way? Well, at the moment, we have eight people doing this. After you do this user story, three people will be able to do it. Brilliant. So you're going to fire five people. Uh, not really. So it's not going to be cheaper. No. Okay, how are they differently? Well, more accurately. Um, okay, a solution for more accurately is a completely different solution for faster. Now, let's talk about more accurately, how much more accurately? Well, not really because the current system is accurate. Okay, so let's not do it. And after about 10 minutes of this, that's why it takes 10 minutes. After about 10 minutes of this, somebody's going to come up with a plausible excuse. And they're going to say, ah, we're going to make it faster. And they say, okay, how much faster is faster? And then you put a victory condition on that. Oh, is it going to be 2% faster, 10% faster, 50% faster, 5,000% faster? How much? And this is our turn-by-turn -turn navigation. This is something we can measure on a shorter scale 
behavior changes should be observable as soon as you launch a user story. Profit, customer satisfaction, brand awareness, all those kind of brilliant things, market share, they come on, de on a delayed scale. You can't measure that as a result of a single user story. Behavior changes, yes, you can. And then we can figure out whether this is going in the right direction or not. And this is kind of the turn-by-turn -turn thing that we used for our GPS for software. And what that allows us to do is start moving away from linear backlogs and start creating hierarchical backlogs. Because if doing something faster is what we want to do, first of all, how much faster is faster? How many ideas do we have for making this faster? Let's remove the all accurate, more accurate ideas and kind of cheaper ideas. Let's keep the faster ideas and let's kind of figure out whether this is actually faster. Then we can start tying that stuff up and creating multiple ideas under this and then figuring out how does this fit into the overall picture. So we can start creating hierarchical backlogs where on the top there's, oh, you know, we want to improve operation costs. Then underneath we have, oh, we do this faster, we do that faster. Those are kind of behavior change ideas. Then underneath we have user stories and kind of stuff that goes through the cycle in iteration and things like that. But we can measure the success of each of these things with the thing above it. So say I have 30 user stories for making things 10% faster and the first story magically makes it 12% faster. I don't have to do the other 29 stories. I've done. And at the same time, if we have 30 user stories for making something 10% faster, but the first 10 stories don't actually move this dial in the right direction at all. Well, we have a problem. Something unexpected happened. A time-based or a local-based or a human-based dimension opened up that we don't know about that's preventing us from doing this. Maybe at the time when people thought about this, it was a good idea, but hey, it's not happening. So there's no reason to go and do the other 25 stories because we need to replan. We need to figure out what's going on. Maybe try a different thing. So um, as an example of this, I'll, I'll show you a, this collaboration product I've mentioned. Uh, we were trying to build up the user base for about two years and it was growing gradually. This is kind of the user growth curve. And after this thing that kind of helped us get unstuck, it took us about a year and a half to actually do the thing over there. And I would love to tell you that kind of we figured out a really, really interesting software feature and it was really difficult to do and we spent nights coding it and it was amazing and we had, you know, lots of work to do that. But in fact, kind of two years of development pretty much didn't do much for us where this thing did. Adding a string in a configuration file. So what happened is we got a really angry email from a university admin saying, how could you possibly build your software stupidly like this? He said, okay, you know, let's, let's talk about what's the problem. He said, well, why do I, you know, I got 700 requests to approve this app. Why we just not built like a bulk install? He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's a web app. It doesn't, it doesn't get installed. I mean, you're running it on our server. He said, no, 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 I have to approve this app for every stupid student in the university. And I hate students and I hate their approvals and everything. And he said, well, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, you know, obviously some unexpected thing that I don't know about happened. So let's talk about this. So what, what it turns out is we built this thing to integrate well with Google Apps and save stuff to Google Drive. Now, normally what happens is when you want to save it to Google Drive, a dialogue pops up saying, would you like to allow this app to access Google Drive? You say, yep. It goes there, done. At universities, stuff happens differently. You say, yep, I want to, but then it goes to the admin who hates students. And then the admin says, no. Or, you know, he gets 700 requests and he gets really kind of angry. So at this point, I realized, okay, you know, there's, there's, there's a local dimension I do not know about that's kind of universities. We never planned for this thing to be used there, but let's figure out whether we can make it work better. And I found this is all we need to do to allow the admin to kind of just say install. But then what started happening is when the admin says install, it gets installed by default to even people who didn't request it. So we got this stuff here. Because of a time-based dimension that was at the start of kind of university year, lots of people were kind of coming to the university, then they noticed, oh, there's this new software that everybody else is using, and we got that. Now, kind of that's kind of the, the, the best example I can show you of this kind of local dimension and time-based dimension opening up that we had no idea about, but that helped more than two years of development. So kind of 
to conclude this stuff, um, here's a couple of references that you can research further. Uh, one is a kind of visualization technique for plans like this. It's called impact mapping. You can find it on impactmapping.org. This is helping people capture behavior changes that kind of stakeholders are expected to have and users are expected to have, and then mapping deliverables to that and helping you create an operational awareness. This is kind of a roadmap a true roadmap, multiple roads, multiple options, allowing people to discuss this stuff. Have a look at impactmapping.org for that. Um, I've mentioned a couple of books and kind of um, here they are. So one is adapted by Tim Hartford. The other is uh, Anthony Ulrich's book, What Customers Want. Um, How to Measure Anything is a brilliant book about getting the right metrics in place. And you can have a look at kind of the impact mapping book as well. Um, there's the, the practice is a lot more explained and as a small present for spending an hour with me, I want to give you kind of a ebook of one of my recent books. If you go to this URL, um, you'll be able to download the book for free over the next 30 days. And this thing has a lot more about what I just talked about. So thank you very much. I hope I've kind of tickled your imagination at least a bit. And go and create a GPS for your software. Thank you.